Guns, tragedy, emotion in politics. Those are the topics of tonight's byline. Tragedy struck the West Island of Montreal this week. A 12-year-old boy shot and killed his 16-year-old brother. I can relate to this story in so many ways. I do have a 12-year-old son, and I can only imagine what this would do to him, how we would react, how crushed and distraught he would be if this happened to him. From the best information we have, and police aren't releasing all the details yet, the boy and his brother were playing with a loaded handgun, a pistol, in the house. The gun went off. The 16-year-old was dead. That section of Montreal is an area I've known well for many years. I've covered stories there. I've shopped in the area. And in fact, before I was offered a job back here in Ottawa, I'd rented a house. I was supposed to move in not too far from this home. My heart goes out to this family, and this is a horrible tragedy that will haunt them for the rest of their lives. Nothing can be done to bring the 16-year-old back. I'm sure he will be missed and grieved by his family and friends. But I have to say, there's something disturbing about the reaction of the story. It's being used for politics. Quebec's public security minister, Stéphane Bergeron, said, This is proof of the need for a gun registry. Here's his quote. It's a sad story, and the other thing is that it proves to me, for me, that we have to do something about the gun registry. That was his reaction to local media in Quebec. As you know, Quebec is pushing to get the federal long gun registry. He's making it about this. I'm sorry, but a boy just died, and you, sir, are using his death to advance your political cause. That's disgusting. But hold on a minute, because this gets worse. As I said at the beginning, the boys were playing with a handgun, a pistol. Those firearms are still registered and highly restricted in Canada. The Montreal police have told me that this was a legal gun, fully registered. The handgun, it was in the registry that's been in place for more than 70 years. Had the long gun registry that was recently scrapped still been in place, it wouldn't have changed anything. Mr. Bergeron's comments are not only ignorant, they're fully disgusting because he's playing on people's emotions. People will be horrified and think, well, what if this was my family? That's a natural reaction to this. But then he slips politics into it, his own political agenda. We shouldn't be surprised, though, because this is what happens time and again. Remember, I've warned you, do not trust politicians of any stripe who spot a tragedy and promise they can stop it from ever happening again. They can't. We've had tough handgun laws in this country and a registry since 1934. Once you get your regular gun license, that's for long guns, you need a second license to get a handgun, and the rules on handling are, are tight. Failure to follow those rules results in tough penalties. None of that saved this boy. They were doing something they shouldn't have been doing. They were playing with a loaded gun. It's the type of thing the boys have done for generations, but it is dangerous. And this time it ended horribly. Stéphane Bergeron, or columnist and pundits, turning it into a political cause is inexcusable. But unfortunately, not surprising. And that's the byline. Together we are introducing legislation to help end the mass shootings. The bill subjects existing or grandfathered weapons to a background check. The purpose is to dry up the supply of these weapons over time. Now down in the United States, they are also reacting to tragedy by using a motion to push politics. It's been going on since the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary in December. Now, I told you that President Obama's proposals would not stop another Sandy Hook and that it was a call to ban rifles based on cosmetics. Well, California Senate Democrat Dianne Feinstein introduced her legislation this week, and you guessed it, it's all about how rifles look, not how they function. Here's a description of what will be used to determine a ban if Feinstein's bill is passed. I took this directly from her website. Quote, all semi-automatic semi rifles that can accept a detachable magazine and have at least one military feature, pistol grip, forward grip, folding, telescoping, or detachable stock, grenade launcher or rocket launcher, barrel shroud, or threaded barrel. Now, other than rocket launcher and grenade launcher, rockets and grenades being things most Americans cannot legally buy, this is mostly a list of cosmetic items. Feinstein even brags that thousands of other rifles are still legal under this. So what's the point? 
Well, it's all about being seen to be doing something. Joining me now from Washington is David Martosco. He's the executive editor of The Daily Caller. Now, uh, David, to me, this is the ultimate political move for elected officials of all stripes, isn't it? Be seen to be doing something, even if what you're doing won't fix what you claim it will. Well, it's not about fixing anything. It's about demonstrating that your intentions are good, that you have an emotional reaction that your constituents will identify with. Um, look, nobody on the left who is pushing these gun control proposals right now actually believes in their heart that they're going to stop the next crazy person from stealing a rifle and shooting people. And they won't, but I don't even think the people who are proposing the bans believe they will. It's all about but, their but, intentions. They, they say that that's what it's about, though. So are they trying to fool the public? Because you and I look in, into the minutia of policy, because that's what we're paid to do. But whether it's this or other issues, I talk to people and I say, well, this won't work. Here's why. And they get a look of shock over their faces if, well, I didn't know that. I, I read in the paper or I heard from so-and-so politician this would work. Well, I think a lot of analysts don't think three moves ahead like a chess player. And a lot of analysts don't understand human behavior. You know, it's like when you raise taxes on people and you think, oh, well, that solves the problem. We have more money in the government now without thinking that when you raise taxes, people change their behavior. They move out of the state, they move out of the country, they stop hiring people. The economy changes, it's dynamic. In this way, people's behavior will change. If you outlaw this kind of gun, people will get that kind of gun. Uh, or people who are really upset about it will leave. They'll go somewhere else and they'll have guns there and if they're unstable, they'll kill people somewhere else. Um, but I don't think the politicians themselves actually believe this stuff. I think it's all about electoral priorities. You have to understand right now in the United States, you've got a president who just started a second term and he's got a problem. His primary problem is the fact that the U.S. House of Representatives is still controlled by the opposition party, the Republicans. Everything he does for the next eight to 10 months from a policy point of view is going to be calculated to try to change that. This is about shaming Republicans. It's about shaming conservatives into adopting positions that are gonna make them seem weak or make them seem indecisive so that they don't win re-election in 2014, which is the next time members of the House will stand for re-election. This is all about putting the House of Representatives in Democrats' hands so that President Barack Obama can have two years at the end of this term, from 2014 to 2016, where he's going to run the White House and his party will run both houses of Congress. If the Democrats take back the House, they will own and run Washington, and that will be two years where Obama can get done anything his left-leaning heart desires. So this is about changing electoral results. It's not about changing gun realities for anybody. So the fact that... Um this doesn't have the votes to potentially pass in the Senate because a lot of Democrats don't like Feinstein's proposal. That doesn't really matter because it's about beating up the other guy for the next election, even though you just finished one. If that's reality, that's, right. that's pretty sad. But that's where we are in this country. That's exactly what our political process is like. We fight these battles on the margins. Um, you don't have these big societal sweeping motions that everybody agrees with. It's here's a proposal and we can expect these guys to hate it, these guys to like it. Um, and then they go ahead and, and do pre-polling. I guarantee you that in major uh, and hotly contested congressional districts all around the country, analysts and political prognosticators put polls in the field before Feinstein's bill dropped to ascertain how much support they could sap from Republicans who oppose it. That's what this is about. It's about political numbers wow. gaming and unfortunately, we're in a city right now in Washington, D.C., where I'm sitting, where this stuff never stops. It is a cottage industry unto itself, and it's always about looking forward to the next election. Always, well, always, always. Let me, uh, I want to play a clip for you. This is uh, Al Cannon. He's the county sheriff in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, and he says he won't do it, so I'll play you the clip, and then I want to know, is this even enforceable with people like Al Cannon out there? Roll the clip. Another element that, that I, I strongly disagree with is the idea that somehow or another this is going to prevent um, the kind of violence that, that, uh, that, that everybody's concerned about. But I think that um, much of this is, is taking advantage of our grief and, and people's general uh, lack of information and understanding about firearms in general. So Al Cannon says, now, I'm not going to enforce this if it comes in. Is he allowed to do that? And is this, will this uh, make the law crumble if it actually does pass, which we've just said is unlikely? Well, several uh, sheriffs in the United States at the county level have said this. Uh, personally, I think it's a little bit silly. It comes off as whiny. Uh, you may as well have a sheriff say, well, 
You know, the federal government forced us to lower the speed limit to 55 miles an hour if we wanted to get our highway funds. <laughs> but that's still, I'm not going to enforce the speed limit. I mean, that's ridiculous. Who does that? Uh, it's what the sheriff's suggesting is not sustainable. Uh, the federal government can do anything from, you know, deputize state policemen to calling in the National Guard to restore order if a sheriff were to abdicate his responsibility. <laughs> so it's silly. And I know most of the sheriffs who are coming out and saying these things <clears throat> are themselves Republicans. They are elected officials, too. The Democrats love when this happens because there's going to be some segment of the population who's going to say, well, <laughs> that's ridiculous. I'm a Democrat. That sheriff's a Republican. He's ignoring his duties. I'm going to come to the ballot specifically to vote against him next time. And while those Democrats are there throwing the sheriff out of office, they will vote right down the line, Democrat, 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 Democrat. And that's how House seats change hands. It's not that people come to vote the House member out of office. It's that they come to vote against the sheriff. They come to vote against or for some ballot initiative, some um, referendum matter. Or in a presidential election year, <laughs> they come to vote for the president. But 2014 is not a presidential election year. So you're going to need, if you're a Democrat, all of these side issues and these down ticket ballot things to drive people to the polls to throw out Republican congressmen. And right. if a lot of sheriffs momentum this thing over, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be people coming to vote their sheriff out of office and electing Democratic House members in the process. And that's what the president wants. David, thanks so much for talking to us. We'll talk to you again soon. David Martosko is Anytime. with The Daily Caller. He's the executive editor over there. Check them out.